I'm Tini, welcome back to my channel. Um, I don't know about you, but for me, March has felt so long this year. I don't know why. Um, there is an upside to that though, and that is that I got so much reading done this month. I read 11 books. It was also a really good reading month for me. I read mostly four and five star books. I do actually have a video going up soon maybe about my rating system and how I rate books. So if you are at all curious about that, that video is coming soon. Um, but we have 11 books to get through. So I'm gonna try and be a little bit quicker than I have been. These videos are becoming really, really long and I'm trying to not make every single video I put on my channel like half an hour. <laughs> so without further ado, let's get into the books shall we? The first book that I read in March, I actually started in February and then finished in March and it was The Rapture by Claire McGlasson. This book features in two of my reading vlogs. I start reading it in one and then I finish reading it in the other so I will link both of those down below. I adored this book. Um, it is about two women in a religious cult in the 1920s who develop a relationship. It is fictional, but it's based on a real cult that genuinely existed in Bedford at the time, which I didn't realise until I started reading it. And I grew up really close to Bedford and I went to college in Bedford, which was mind blowing. And it was so interesting to find out this piece of history that I had no idea about, about this place that I know really well. So that was part of the reason I loved the book. Um, but also the story is fantastic. Um, Dillis, our main character, who did really exist, but she is an incredibly unreliable narrator, which is one of my personal favourite tropes. I love unreliable narrators. And she's also like struggling with her sexuality, which is something I think Claire McGlasson entirely made up. Um, but I did enjoy that in the story. You know, I feel like I don't need to explain that attitudes to homosexuality in a religious cult in the 1920s were probably not positive. There is a lot of discussion in the book about Christianity and sexuality and how that reconciles. You know, Dillis kind of quotes Bible passages that seem to support her love and then also Bible passages that seem to condemn the nature of her love. Um, and it's really interesting, I really enjoyed that part of the book. Um, as I was reading it, I almost gave it four stars because I didn't like the ending. But then there was an afterword by Claire McGlasson and she explained what happened to the real Dillis in real life, like how her life actually turned out. And I realised that the ending kind of had to be the way it was to be true to the real Dillis Baltrop's life. So it went straight back up to a five stars. I would definitely recommend this if you are into cult kind of stories, if you like mysteries, if you like unreliable narrators, this is a book for you. The next book I read in March was, and this is long overdue, I should have read this a long time ago, it's mind blowing, it took me this long to get around to, but it was The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. I gave this five out of five. Incredible. I think it's so fantastic. If you watch a lot of booktube I will be really surprised if you haven't heard of this book or what it is about but just in case it is about a young black teenager named Star who lives in the poor and predominantly black neighbourhood that she grew up in but attends quite a prestigious predominantly white school and she struggles to balance like those two aspects of her life because she feels like she doesn't fully belong and can't fully be herself in either of the spaces she inhabits. And then that kind of internal conflict within her is ultimately exacerbated when she witnesses her best friend, Khalil, another black teenager from her neighborhood, murdered by a police officer. Um, Khalil is not doing anything wrong. There was no reason to pull him over. Um, he was unarmed, he wasn't doing anything wrong, but he is shot. This is such an important read. I It is YA and I think I put it off for a really long time because it's YA, um, which was wrong of me. Um, 
I don't know what my prejudice there was, um, but it is so fantastic and I'm so glad that YA like this exists now. Um, I said in the reading vlog that I read this in that when I was a teenager it felt like all YA was like Twilight, The Hunger Games, it was just about like straight, white, cis, able-bodied teenage girls with no personality in like dystopian and fantasy romances, like that was all YA felt like it was, except Knots and Crosses by Mallory Blackman, I think that was the only YA series that like didn't fit into that mould, so I'm so glad that much more important YA is coming out now. This is quite a difficult read in places, obviously it is about a very serious, very real thing that happens in the world, but that is why it's so important to read. I feel like Andy Thomas captures the nuance of everything so well. If you have not picked up this book yet, pick it up. It's in incredible. Sorry if the camera angle has changed ever so slightly, um, my camera battery died. Um, I really need to get a new camera battery because this keeps happening. Um, but I had to like go charge the battery for a bit and then reset everything up. Um, I'm gonna try and be a little bit quicker because I feel like I am already spending way longer on talking about these books than I intended to. Um, but let us carry on. The third book I read in March, I don't have with me because I listened to it on audio so I'll put a little picture up here, but it was The Nickel Boys by Colson Whitehead. It's a book that I wanted to read for ages and I really, really enjoyed it. It is about a young black man called Elwood living in the Jim Crow South in the 1960s. He is intelligent, hardworking, honest, he joins the civil rights movement, he worships Martin Luther King, he manages to enrol in some college classes and his future looks super bright but it is all ripped away from him when he falls victim to the system and is sentenced to a juvenile reformatory for a crime that he did not commit. The reformatory is called the Academy and it claims to be this like wonderful progressive reformatory that's gonna make these boys into better men but in reality it is just a chamber of horrors with corrupt and abusive staff. The book is mostly about Elwood's time in the Nickel Academy and the things that he witnesses and experiences while he's there and his building desire to bring justice to this place for the sake of the boys who were being mistreated and abused. Um, I thought this book was fantastic. It's really kind of at its heart an exploration of the history of violence in the American justice system, particularly in regards to race, but also kind of just in general. I gave it a four out of five. I thought it was incredible. I'm definitely gonna be picking up some more Colson Whitehead, but it was so, so good. The fourth book I read in March was another audiobook. It was a really quick listen. It was We Are the Weather by Jonathan Safran Foer. It's a really interesting non-fiction about climate change and it focuses mainly on the idea of eating less animal products as a major solution but it also examines the attitudes towards climate change both public, government um, and individual and why people are so resistant to change for the sake of the climate um, kind of because it seems like this abstract thing, like it's it's not really something tangible and why we don't take it seriously enough and why we're kind of not designed to take that kind of threat seriously. It is narrated by the author um, and I enjoyed the way he talks and writes because he's not really lecturing you and he does highlight his own failings a lot, which I definitely really appreciated. I gave it a 3.5 out of 5. It was really thought-provoking, it was a quick read, I would definitely recommend it if the climate crisis is something you want to read more about. I think it's a good like introductory non-fiction about it. Um, I really want to read The Uninhabitable Earth, but that book scares me um, and I think this was a good precursor to that. Um, the next book, so book five, was if I Can't Have You by Charlotte Levin. I think Grace from GK Reads mentioned this in her anti-Valentine's reading vlog um, and then I saw it in Sainsbury's for like four pounds so I just kind of picked it up on a whim and I'm so glad I did because I really really enjoyed it. This is one of the best thrillers I've ever read. Normally once I finish a thriller 
I have this shelf down here that I sit in front of um, that is for books that I don't want to keep and I want to give to charity and most of the time thrillers end up on it once I've read them just because I don't tend to reread thrillers but this this made it to the the bookshelf. It is about a young woman in her mid-twenties called Constance who has moved to London from Manchester because she is running from something. She gets a job as a receptionist at a doctor's office and a new doctor starts working there and they very quickly strike up a romantic relationship. Her kind of initial interest in him very very quickly becomes infatuation which then very very quickly spirals into like complete unhealthy obsession and when he dumps her things get very very sinister very very quickly. As I said I really enjoyed it. It's definitely more of a literary thriller which is why I feel like maybe I liked it a little bit more. It's not really got kind of the classic twists and turns of a thriller which I actually really appreciated. I like that it wasn't kind of crammed with plot stuff. It was very much more about this young woman's state of mind and kind of witnessing the way that she justifies her decisions and I think Constance is such an interesting character because you don't like her and you don't agree with any of the decisions that she makes even though you think the guy is an arsehole um, but you can see the way that she is arriving at those decisions and the way that she justifies those decisions to herself and the way that she like deliberately misinterprets situations and events to then justify and excuse her actions. Um, I give this a 3.5 out of 5. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I definitely recommend this if like literary kind of thrillers are your thing, if you like like dark, a sinister, creepy stories. The next book I read in March was Blonde Roots by Bernadine Avariso. I was very kindly given this for Christmas by a really close friend. It is by Bernadine Avariso, who is one of my favourite authors of all time. This is one of her earlier books. The basic premise of this book is that it is a reversal of the transatlantic slave trade. So Africans are the slave masters and Europeans are the slaves. I really thought this was executed so, so well. In the reimagining of the slave trade with the races reversed, so many poignant points are made about the real history and legacy of the real slave trade. Um, I thought she did that so well. Like, for example, in this world it is curvaceous, dark-skinned women who are the ideal beauty standard and these skinny, flat-chested white women who are told that they are not good enough, told that they are not beautiful, told that they are ugly, but then still told that they are extremely promiscuous and sexual and massively sexualized by the society. And this obviously contrasts and therefore sheds light on the way that our society holds those European beauty standards as ideal and, you know, anyone that doesn't fit into that is viewed as lesser. That's just one example of the many, many, many things this book does um, to, in like a similar vein of like using the role reversal to highlight the real life issues. Uh, the book is split into three parts, so in the first and final part we follow Doris who has been abducted from Europe and forced into slavery. We follow like her journey and her bid for freedom, but then the middle section is writings from the perspective of a slave trader and slave owner. He writes about like colonial attitudes and uses the disgusting vitriol of eugenics to explain how biologically um, white European ethnicities are the inferior race. And again that contrast, that, that reversal contrasts and shows and sheds a light on the way that real white colonists viewed black slaves and the legacy that that has had and how those views have had a lasting effect on stereotypes and systemic oppression and how those attitudes are really still kind of ingrained in our society today. Um, but yeah, four out of five, you should absolutely read this. It wasn't quite a five out of five for me just because I was comparing it to 
things like Mr. Loverman and Girl, Woman, Other, and this is a much, much earlier book from Bernadine Evaristo. Um, and you can see like a lot of the beginnings of the way that she writes and the way she writes characters and the way she writes stories. Um, but it just, it just wasn't up there with, with those books for me from her. Um, but I'm absolutely gonna continue collecting these beautiful editions of her books and I'm hoping to get them all and read them all. The next book I read in March was The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. I adored this book so it is about a young woman called Nora who feels like she has wasted her entire life and she's made all the wrong decisions um and she just she wishes she could just go back and change so many things she has so many regrets this is not a spoiler because it's literally on the synopsis on the back of the book but when nora dies she wakes up in a library and the librarian tells her all of these books are different decisions you could have made and you can try some out and decide if maybe you'd like to continue living in one of these lives. Um, so fantastic premise. This book was so much fun. It's very like, um, it's very adventurous because she's trying out all of these different lives she could have had and it feels very kind of fun and you feel like you're snooping in on loads of different people's lives, even though it's like her life but just different decisions but like it's very fun in that way but it also touches on some really important topics um particularly mental health um anxiety and depression in particular but just some kind of general and really relatable things like regrets and what is success you know how do we measure that um how do we measure happiness how do we measure what's a good decision and what was a bad decision the pressure that we put on ourselves to make other people in our lives happy and also the way that social media distorts our view of what makes a good life and how badly social media actually affects our mental health so i thought it was really good and it had a really good balance it's not the most original idea for a story you know the, that kind of butterfly effect exploration of different decisions you could have made um but i love the whole like library concept i thought that was so fun and it was just a really good book i read it in like 24 hours i thought it was fantastic i gave it four out of five i definitely recommend it next i'm really trying to speed up here because my battery is about to die again i throughout pretty much the whole month i was listening to becoming by michelle obama if you don't know what becoming is where have you been? Um, it is Michelle Obama's memoir. It covers pretty much her entire life from when she was born to the end of Barack's presidency. Uh, she talks about race, womanhood, motherhood, poverty, politics, class, so much stuff and the ways that all of that intersects for her specifically but also just in general in America. Uh, I don't really have anything more to say on it because I just think it was fantastic and I just think you should read it. Go read Becoming by Michelle Obama. It was fantastic. She is such an inspiring woman. It was also, the audiobook was narrated by her which just made it so much better. It was so touching and inspiring. I'm not going to give it like a rating because I don't really feel comfortable rating someone's life story but it was fantastic and I highly recommend it to anyone. Next was another really short non-fiction. I've realised I read quite a lot of non-fiction this month which is great because I've been trying to read more non-fiction but it was Twas the Night Shift Before Christmas by Adam Kay. Seems a weird time of the year to listen to that book but it was available on Box, and I've been meaning to read it. So it's like kind of a sequel, kind of a companion book to Adam Kay's first book, This Is Gonna Hurt, which I've already read, which I absolutely adored. So Adam Kay was a doctor in the NHS for seven years before he left to become a writer. And This Is Gonna Hurt is a collection of diary entries 
from when he was a practicing doctor, along with his commentary. It is mostly hilarious, because Adam K is hilarious, um, but it is also an incredibly moving and touching insight into the life of a junior doctor in the NHS in the UK. I read it in December in 2019, um, and it was before, it was the night shift before Christmas had come out, um, and it is one of the best books I've ever read. Um, I gave it a 5 out of 5, I know I just said I don't really rate memoirs, um, so I feel like I'm gonna explain something here, um, but I don't like to rate memoirs if it is literally just the story of someone's life, um, but when it kind of has an agenda or like a twist, you know, this is specifically about the NHS, it's teaching you about the life of a doctor as well as being his memoir. I feel a bit more comfortable rating them, I don't know why, it's a personal thing, but I gave this 5 out of 5, I think it was so so good. So Twas the Night Shift Before Christmas is a companion book, like I said, and it's just more of his diary entries from when he was a junior doctor, specifically from the shifts he did at and around Christmas time. Uh, once again, he manages to simultaneously make you like howl with laughter, but also cry <laughs> um, because some of it is so moving and some of it's so sad and also some of it's real gross because he works in obs and gyne, which is something as a person who's like not particularly keen on the idea of having my own children, grosses me out. <laughs> um, he, he just manages to, while being so hilarious, just get across the incredible work that NHS staff do and the incredible pressure that they are put under, and also just how incredibly overworked, underpaid and underappreciated that they are. Um, four out of five for that one, I thought it was so good. Um, mainly wasn't a five out of five just because it was so short um, and I could honestly read his entire diaries and I think I'd find them fantastic. Um, if you read and liked This Is Gonna Hurt, I absolutely recommend it. If you haven't read either of them, go pick them up, you know? This looks completely different. I'm now filming on my phone. My camera battery died again. Um, I'm gonna buy a new camera battery because this is getting ridiculous. Um, but I'm now filming on my phone because I just don't have like an hour to wait for my camera to charge. I only have three more books to talk about so I hope you don't mind too much, but let us carry on with the books. So the next book I read was another audiobook and it was The Thursday Murder Club by Richard Osman. I have wanted to read it since it came out, but I'm not about to financially cripple myself by buying hardbacks. It is about a group of elderly people in a retirement community who meet up every Thursday and solve murders. Um, some of them like used to be police officers, used to be psychologists, used to be nurses. So they get together every Thursday and they try and solve these unsolved murders and mysteries. And one day, somebody is murdered at the retirement home and they have a real murder to solve. What more do you want from the premise of a book? Like, if that is not the perfect premise for a book, I don't know what is. And it was truly fantastic. I think Richard Osman just wrote it so well, like it is absolutely one of my all-time favourite books now. I think it was so, so good. Um, he really captures like the essence of these elderly people in that, you know, you don't stop being a whole complex human because you become elderly. You don't stop having an interesting life and in a complex world because you're elderly, you don't stop having a personality because you're elderly. He really captures these personalities so, so well and you just love everyone in the book. Oh, it's so perfect. Also, he did a really good job, I think, personally, of having a pretty diverse cast of characters um, and also holding space for conversation about that as well. Um, so Donna, who is the main police officer in the case, is black. One of the members of the Thursday Murder Club is from Egypt. One of the suspects in the case is a Polish immigrant. And there's a lot of discussion about the ways in which these people are treated because of their race, their gender, the place that they are from. I think it was really good. I think he really held space for that in a really great way. Also, 
there's some beautiful moments in the book. Like, the book is mostly quite funny because it is about a bunch of elderly people solving murders and just these really wonderful moments of real, real genuine hilarity. You know, there's no jokes in the book. There are just, like, funny moments that feel very real. And there are also just these wonderful moments of tenderness. One of the character's partners has dementia and he's losing his memory and she really struggles with that and one of her best friends has had a stroke it has rendered her paralyzed and mute um but she goes to visit her every day and still talks to her like she can hear her and there are just these beautiful moments in the book i just it was a perfect book five out of five i'm definitely gonna try and pick up a physical copy of the book as soon as i can because i just want it on my shelves for when I am sad. <laughs> I already want to reread it and I never reread books. I thought, oh, it was so good. It was so good. It was so good. Okay, we are now moving on to the last physical book that I read in March. And it's another one that I was like pretty late to the party on. And it is Little Fires Everywhere by Celeste Ng. I hate the cover of this book. I've said it in like three videos now because I used this book in my reading habits tag to illustrate the way that I read books and I also talked about it in a vlog that I'm filming at the moment where I finish it and I'm gonna say it again in this video. The cover of this book is disgusting. I hate it. Um, it is the TV tie-in cover and it's, and it's gross. I hate it. Um, I I despise all TV time covers. I, in general, don't like books with photographs of people on. I'm just more drawn to illustrated covers, but I got this from a charity shop and you take what you can get, you know? Um, the book though, the book is very good. I give it four out of five. It is about Shaker Heights, which is one of those weird, like, planned communities, I guess is the best way to describe it, where like, everything has been designed you know and on the surface it looks like this perfect progressive community but the moral of the story is that you know as i'm sure we all know places like this are never as perfect as they seem so one of the main characters that we follow in this book is mrs richardson eleanor richardson she grew up in shaker heights she is a journalist for like a local newspaper her husband is like a hotshot lawyer in the town. They have four children. Um, the two eldest ones are both very popular, very academic. These like perfect suburban children, except they're not. Her younger two children are a little bit more troubled. Like her youngest son is a bit of a social outcast. Like, you know, he doesn't, you know, he keeps his head down. He's good at school, but he doesn't really fit in with all the other kids. Um, and then her youngest daughter, Izzy, is like this rebellious, feisty teen and like the whole family have this weird tension with her. She's always acting out. She's always causing trouble, getting herself into trouble, etc. Uh, and their lives are kind of just carrying on as normal. But when a nomadic artist called Mia and her teenage daughter, Pearl, move in as tenants to an apartment that the Richardsons own. The two families' lives become incredibly intertwined. Uh, Mrs Richardson has a very, very strict view on the way that lives should be lived. She feels like she has played life according to the rules, you know? She finished school, she got a job, she got a husband, she got a house, she had kids, that's the way you should live your life according to Miss Richardson. So Mia's kind of nomadic existence kind of flitting across the country as she pleases, taking her daughter with her, um, really disturbs Mrs Richardson and she's a journalist, she's super nosy and she becomes obsessed with finding out about Mia's history and her past um, because Mia is quite mysterious, she doesn't like talking about her past and both of the family's lives are completely upended by the events that unfold. I thought this was fantastic. For me, it felt very much like it was about class and privilege and abuses of power 
Um, there is also a kind of thread throughout the book about motherhood, what makes a mother in the first place, biology or love, what makes a good mother. There's this really kind of interesting plot kind of in the periphery but it does feature quite heavily in the book um, about a third family who live in Shaker Heights. Um, they are a white couple and they adopt a Chinese baby and there's this really interesting kind of discussion that's examined from all sides about the ethics of interracial adoption and the impact on the child which was actually one of the parts of the plot that I was like the most interested in. Um, so I thought that that was really really good. I gave it four out of five stars um, just because the first half of the book felt really slow um, and I thought I wasn't gonna like it. Um, like it really felt like it was dragging for me and I thought that I wasn't gonna like it and I got really worried because I know how many people adore this book but the second half like really really picks up and I really enjoyed it in the end. So four out of five stars for Little Fires Everywhere by Celeste Ng. Now the last book. I actually finished it yesterday. It's another audiobook and another non-fiction. I read so much non-fiction this month, I'm so proud of myself. Um, but it was Maybe You Should Talk to Someone by Laurie Gottlieb. It is her memoir, I guess. She is a therapist. She also sees a therapist. So the book is mainly kind of about therapy, I guess. Um, it's like her telling the stories of some of her patients. Obviously, she's changed names and things. Um, but also her telling her own story of going through the process of being in therapy and how even though she is a therapist herself, she still found herself reacting in the same ways that her patients do, that she gets like almost frustrated with um, when she's in the therapist's chair, but she was doing exactly the same things and reacting in exactly the same ways. It's about the process of therapy, the way that it works, and it's also got some really insightful stuff about just the way that human brains work and how we process trauma and grief and big life events and changes. And I thought that, that was really interesting. It is really funny in places, it is also really touching in places. Um, it actually reminded me of This Is Gonna Hurt by Adam Kay in its tone and the way that it balances kind of funny anecdotes against moving, touching, sometimes even heartbreaking insights into her life, her patients' lives and the way that humans work in general. But yeah, I really, really loved it. I gave it a 4.5 out of 5 and I definitely recommend it if you can get hold of it. So yeah, those are all the books I read in March. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to watch this. I really hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know if you've read any of the books I talked about today, if you liked them, if you didn't like them, if you agree with my review, if you didn't agree with my reviews. Um, let me know, let's have a discussion. Thank you so so much for watching and I hope to see you in another video again soon.